Go ahead and open your Bibles to the fourth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. Hallelujah. Praise God forever. Woke up this morning, plan, went to bed planning on preaching one thing, and um, somewhere around four o'clock, four, quarter after four, Janie woke up, and, um, and then I just couldn't go back, and then while I'm laying there wide awake, um, the Lord kept saying, I kept hearing these words, so finally about five, about five, ten after five, I got up and, and went down to the bonus room, got on my computer, and, and um, started looking at what the Lord was talking to me about, and... Um, so I did go back to bed, but it was right much later. So I had a sermon change. Hallelujah. Well, at least it didn't happen when I got here. <laughs> I got it before I got here this time. Hallelujah. Maybe he's been trying to do that all along, and I just, just slept right through. I don't know. Glory to God. But, it, you know, uh, I'm laying there like I'm doing everything I can to go back to sleep, and, and I keep hearing these words roll on, over on me. And, um, and he says, are you going to get up? <laughs> Well, I guess so. You know, just, it's kind of like one of those things where you're wrestling, wrestling, just throwing the towel. I'm getting up. Hallelujah. There's no need to stay in bed any longer, so I'm not going back to sleep this way. But I got some good sleep when I did go back. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But the Lord, these words kept rolling over. And I, I can't tell if I'm in the house or not. Uh, can, can somebody tell if I'm in the house? Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I kept hearing these words, call, though, uh, call on the Lord. Call on the Lord. I'd turn over and I'd hear these words. Call on the Lord. <laughs> Call on the Lord. Hallelujah. And, um, and when I got to the scripture that kind of kept rising up on the inside of me, it's supposed to be in here. Where are you? I know I got that in my notes. It's the, very, it's the main important scripture. Look at Jeremiah 33. <laughs> it's, it's the one scripture that, met, that missed my notes. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 33, 3. I kept I call on, calling the Lord, then I, I heard the, the scripture. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty, or great and hidden things, which thou knowest not. Hallelujah. There's a lot of times there's wisdom, there's answers, there's insight we have need of, and we're looking in all the wrong places because we're not calling on the Lord. You see, God said, call on me, and I, what did you say? I might answer. I'll think about answering. Someday in the sweet by and by, I'll answer. We need this, we need this side of the church like this side of the church. Action point. Get busy. We are here so... So people get it. Amen. So we want to get them in here, get them saved, get, them, get, get the life of God in them, get them victorious, and get, and get them going. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise God. So you guys over here, let's fill this side up. Who am I talking to? Come on, point, point yourself. I'm here. So people get it. All right. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Jeremiah 33, God says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee. And then this is, you know, he's going to answer you. He's going to show you great and hidden or mighty things you know not. You see, I'm going to tell you something. Can I say something real plain? Your buddy don't, can't show you great and hidden things you know not. Unless they're speaking by the Holy Ghost. Now, if they, if they preface it with, my, well, I think you should, Say, stop. Because what you think I should and what God says I should are two different things. Unless you're speaking by the Holy Ghost. And then you wouldn't be prefacing what I think you should. You know, I, I think the Bible tells us, or what the Word of God would she teach us, or the Holy Spirit would share with us. And then you've got to substantiate it. It'll keep you out of trouble. Not only will it keep you out of trouble, it'll put you into the blessing. See, when we follow the wisdom of God, you know, the Spirit of God called in the Old Testament. One of the names, they gave seven names, but one of them is the Spirit of Wisdom and Counsel. Woo! Glory to God. Thank God there's a Spirit of Wisdom and Counsel. 
Now listen, we can, we can do counseling. We can kind of give you our opinion. We can tell you what we think. We can give you life experience. But I am telling you, nothing will measure up to the spirit of wisdom and counsel. Amen. 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 You know, as a pastor, we, as, as, as any minister, when you're counseling people, you have to endeavor to yield to the Holy Ghost so the Spirit speaks, not you. Because you can get your opinion in there and mess it up. Hello? Well, I think, you know, well, what you think? And, and, and $4.50 will get you a, a tall uh, frappuccino at Starbucks. Used to be able to say that in a quarter would get you a cup of coffee. Not anymore. Not even at the, not even at the gas station they won't get you a cup of coffee. You know? They're all got designer coffee at the gas stations. What happened to Maxwell House? Anybody? I, I grew up with Maxwell House around the house. And a percolator. You know, percolating the coffee. Now, me and Nathan, when we go camping, we got a, a Coleman cook set, and we got a percolator. So you put the coffee in the top, put the water in there, put it on top of the campfire, and then just keep going and going and going. Hallelujah. Make you shout. Well, as strong as that coffee is by the time it gets done, make you run three or four times faster. But God tells us that he is the person we're to call on when we need to know mighty things, great things that we don't know about. And what the Spirit of God's endeavoring to get us to do is get back to seeking the face of God. <coughs> it's easier to seek the face of a friend. And let me tell you something. Well, there's a lot of your friends out there are like Job's counselors. You don't need those guys. Go read Job. Those counselors he had were messed up. They weren't right. They were wrong. They gave him the wrong counsel. Come on now. So we need, we need the counsel of the most high. We need the wisdom of the most high. We need answers from heaven. You're facing financial situations. You're facing job situations. You're facing all kinds of situations that the counsel of man does not cut it because of the world system. We need counsel from heaven that will speak to us and bring us into the realization where the anointing is working and the anointing is making a way and the favor of God's going before us and we're getting supernatural results. Go get my bobblehead. <clears throat> That was worth getting up and coming to church for this morning. Amen. We, we've gotten lazy in the church. I was kind of kidding, but go ahead. We've gotten lazy. And in the charismatic word of faith churches, we've gotten lazy about spiritual matters. We want somebody else to say, well, you know, so-and-so did this, I'm going to do it. Well, you know, instead of he hearing from heaven. Instead of hearing from God, instead of getting the word of the Lord. I think I shared this Thursday night over at Pastor Carver's church about how Dad Hagen had that man in his church that was, a, that was an oil rigger. And I, I, I don't know if he's a roughneck. I'm not sure, the guy that runs them. I'm not sure what they call them. The roughnecks were the guys who worked on the rigs. But, I, you know, but, but these weren't ocean. These were land guys. And uh, he was just got to seeking the Lord about you know, his business and about making money. And the Lord spoke to him and says, Go tell your, your foreman to drill here and to drill at a 45-degree angle, and you'll strike oil. And so he did. Foreman fussed with him. Ah, we, we, we pull out geologicals. There's no oil here. There's no oil here. I don't care if there's oil there or not. I want you to drill here, and I want you to drill at a 45-degree angle. That, 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 was, that was a double whammy. I mean, if you're drilling at a 45-degree angle and drilling where there's no oil. He said, do it anyway. I don't want, well, he kept arguing. He said, look, I'm the boss. I'm paying you to do what I want you to do. It struck oil. Came back, you know, after they did that and got that all set up and started pumping oil out. Came back and says, now I want you to drill here. And the guy goes, look, there's no, there's no oil there. He thought he got lucky on the first one. There's no oil here. Here's are geologicals. You know, you know, he does that about three or four times. And finally, when the, after they strike oil every time, he just puts the stuff away and goes to the ball and says, where do you want to drill next? <laughs> See, why? He, had the, he was getting shown great and hidden things he knew not. The spirit of wisdom and counsel. The, <coughs> <laughs> the Spirit of God was showing him supernaturally what to do. Now, that testimony was giving in a meeting, and another oil guy was out there. He heard that, well, God's no respecter of persons. And he went out and started doing it and went bankrupt. Uh -huh. Why? 
Because, listen, it wasn't that God was a respecter of persons. The part that God would not have been a respecter of persons is when if that guy had come to him and sought him and sat before him, God would have given him the wisdom and the counsel he needed to do it, but it wouldn't be exactly the same way. And he would have prospered. But because he tried to copy somebody else's, see, he tried, he's trying to apply the wrong principle. Yet God's not a respecter of persons. If you will seek him the way he did, if you follow after him the way he did, you will get the wisdom and counsel the way he did. The method may not be the exact same, but the wisdom and the counsel would be the same in that it would direct and guide him into prosperity. And that's, where we, that's where we get mixed up sometimes. We let somebody else go get the wisdom and counsel that will work for them, and then we try to copy what they got and call it God's not a respecter of persons. No, he's not going to do your getting for you. We do that all the time in church growth things. You know, we're going we're to follow after what somebody else said. Oh, so-and-so did this. You got to have a bus ministry. And everybody goes out and buys buses. And then half of them end up with these jalopies from 1964. There's nothing but a, but, a, but a money drain for getting the engine fixed and getting the oil leaks fixed and getting the, you know, the, the exhaust fumes fixed so you don't kill all the kids on it. And, you know, you got a hand-painted sign, Faith and Victor Church Prosperity Seminar. You come driving up in some old Beverly Hillbillies dilapidated school bus. We got a bus ministry. You know what you don't want if you're not called to have one? Bus ministry. You don't be driving no bus around, picking up people, and it's, it's not God in it. Well, God's always in you know, it. I can't agree with that. No, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. We have to follow after God. How are we going to get that call on him? I said, call on him. See, somebody gets successful or something, they want to go around and teach everybody on how to get successful the way they got successful. And they don't teach the principles of how they got to get successful. They teach the success side. Now, I know one guy, he goes around churches all the time. He was a CEO in a big organization. And he goes around and always teaching churches on leadership principles. But they're worldly leadership principles. And they may, be, they may work for people if God tells you to do it that way. But if God doesn't tell you to do it that way, you can't do it that way. You've got to follow after God. You've got to follow after the principles of the Word. Amen? Now, so certain principles, will, if they're Word-based, the word, the word itself, they will always work when they're Word-based. But when we start moving on to these other arenas, we start trying to copy somebody else's method. It may work in certain places if that's what God speaks to that pastor. He may hear it talk and go, yeah, that's for me. I've heard things talk, and I said, that's not for me. I have. I've heard things, no, that doesn't work for me. And then I've heard other things talk, yeah, that works for me. God bears witness with it to your heart. So God's got to be in it. You just can't copy it because somebody says, this, my, i, I got the biggest church in the country. This is how you get there. Well, if everybody could do it that way, everybody would be doing it that way. If everybody was called to be like that, everybody would be like, be getting that. If everybody was called a Paul or now a David young each other, mm -hmm. now, now let me ask you something. Anybody know a, a church in the world that's done cell groups that is as big as Paul Youngie or David Youngie chose church? Every, I, I'll tell you, 80% of churches in America, the charismatic word of faith circles, tried cell groups. It worked for him in South Korea. He had a church of 800,000 people. Came to America, started teaching cell groups, and, it, it, and you know what happened in most churches? Splits. Because all the people you put in charge of those cell groups that started their own church. They started their little churches and messed up the whole thing. Because everybody was trying to copy a method instead of the principle of hearing from heaven on what to do. God says to call on me. Now, people tell you, hey, you got to do this for your business model. Let, let me say this. Now, 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 now I know Greg, Greg's in the furniture industry. Greg's got a, got a furniture company. Hallelujah. Um, who else in business? Uh, Just in business. There might be basic, there might be some principles they can interchange. But if you're going to grow it supernaturally, God's going to tell Greg one way and probably going to tell Jeff another way. How do they get to that point? By doing the same thing. Call on him and, and he will answer you. And he'll show you great and hidden things you know not. Hallelujah. The spirit of wisdom and counsel will give you understanding. He'll give you direction. He'll give you know-how. He'll show, show you how to do things in your particular arena of life or, or influence or whatever. That he's not showing necessarily somebody else. And, and you'll be able to make it work and make it grow. 
We always say find a niche, you know, and fill it. You know, but you can't find a niche and fill it if that's what not God called you to do, what God told you to do. Because it might not, be, might not work for you to fill that niche. Now, I can tell you one thing about our church, and, um, and as I, I analyze over time, you know, one of, the, one of the things about us is we've always had, a, even though it's not always big, always strong children's ministry. Strong investment in our children. Now, people who've left our church and gone to other churches are running their children's ministries at the churches they're at. And they, they, call, they once in a while tell my wife, you know, uh, you know, I learned to do this from you. Your influence it came from you. You know, well, that's, that's an arena that we're anointed in and called in. Now, I can't go out and try to be some cutting edge something or another. I'm not going to show up next week with, with gauges and, you know, and weights and, you know, bolts and all that kind of stuff. And, that, you know, first of all, I, I couldn't pull it off. I, I, I just couldn't. You know, I mean, I feel half naked coming in with a, with, a, with a polo on. All right? I mean, I'm like, oh, Jesus. You know, my, my, my Pentecostal grandmama just rolled over three times. <laughs> now, I do it sometime. I know, I know Wednesday nights, we, we, we dress down Wednesday nights. What did he say? <laughs> Only when I'm feeling crazy. I have those moments. I bet, I bet y'all don't know that I used to beat my head on cinder block walls to intimidate people. I used to beat lockers in with my head to intimidate people. Yeah. I just walk up to the wall and they, they, they talk junk to me. I say, you want to mess with this? Bam! Do you want to mess with me? You look crazy when you do that. It's because you are crazy. They leave you alone, though. Just because they think you're stupid. People crazy don't fight crazy people. Hallelujah. Me and my high school friend beat two lockers in when I, I mean, beat, beat, he was trying to keep up with me, beating the locker in for a football game with our heads, not with the helmets on. Took the helmets off and then beat, how stupid can you be? I could have left the helmet on and done it, but no, I took the helmet off. Scared your teammates. That's how you scare, you scare your teammates. All right. God says in Psalm 50, 15, he says, call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. And listen, thou shalt glorify me. See, God wants to glory for what he's doing in your life. Praise God. He doesn't want you to go around and brag about how you did this and how you did that. He wants you to go around bragging, man, I was in a tight place. I was in a tough place. And I called on God. He gave me answers. We followed his plan. And look what he did. And start singing, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. Glory to God. We begin to shout and magnify the Lord. Because we're calling on Him. Hallelujah. Too often when we get into a tight place, we start looking all over the place. Friend. We call, start calling this person, calling that person. What do, you think, what do you think I need to do here? What do you think I need to do? There? And listen, I understand. I understand the counsel of, of, of godly people. But there has got to come a point in time in your life where you can get it from God yourself. Where you can call God, He comes and speaks to you. And let me say this. I can tell you that when God speaks to you, it's unmovable and unchangeable in your life. Because if somebody else speaks to you, and you get to a tough place, you know what the devil's going to tell you? You're doing this because so-and-so said you ought to do this. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I, I know I've said this before, but I'm going to give you a little secret. I'd have been long gone 15, 20 years ago if the Lord hadn't told me to come here. Because there were so many opportunities to quit and throw in the towel and run. But you know what kept me from doing that? I know I heard from God. Not it's from somebody else. Not from, no, a pastor buddy, a brother buddy Harrison didn't call me to Greensboro. Pastor John Zabowski didn't call me to Greensboro. As a matter of fact, uh, when, we, when we're looking at taking this church, actually before then, and I'm going to give you the story, and, you know, and if, if, the, if the family may be listening or whatever, I, I don't know they listen to us. You know, this, is no, this is no slam on anybody, but this is how it happened. <coughs> the pastor was, was uh, suffering from a, a, a very uh, aggressive um, melanoma cancer. Um, that had been, he had been healed of it one time, and it came back. And then when he got healed of it, he started, he started the church, started the, the, this, actually this church, 
started this church on his healing testimony, and then sometime after that, it came back and got, and, then, and they wouldn't, wouldn't go to the doctor. Wouldn't go to the doctor. Said, you know, going to the doctor was, was a slam in the face of Jesus. You know, and, uh, and that, that cancer got bigger and bigger. But guys would be there putting diapers on it to catch the drainage. And um, went to Tulsa to be with Buddy Harrison and his, his group out there to get some ministry. He was there. And while he was there, Pastor Harrison, Buddy, B- Brother Buddy, called my pastor. It was, about, it was a regional director for, for the for SCF at the time and said, listen, I need you to have somebody ready to go to Greensboro this weekend. Uh, we're trying to get this guy to stay here and, and get ministry. And so my pastor, he said, well, I, I got Ed. He said, well, that's who I wanted to go was Ed, but, you know. And so, and so I, I'm working a full-time job. I'm now on staff at the church. Um, yeah, I am on staff at the church full-time. I'm not working. I'm working full-time at the church now. I, I, sometimes I get these dates mixed up. I'm working full-time at the church. He said, Ed, you need to be ready to go to Greensboro this weekend at a moment's notice. You, I mean, I need for you, if we tell you Saturday night, you've got to drive to Greensboro, you've got to pack up and go to Greensboro and minister. And he told me the situation. I said, okay. So I'm, I'm praying that week in preparation of... You know, when you're not ministering all the time and you're doing other things, you're doing, I mean, even though you're working at the church, you're not doing, you, a lot of stuff you're doing is not ministry as far as preparing for sermons. Mm-hmm. So I'm taking extra time to get along with God. And I'm, I'm on somewhere in the middle of the week and, and, and the Spirit of God speaks to me. Now, I didn't tell anybody. I told Janie, I think I told Janie, just as a witness. The Spirit of God says, you wouldn't be going to Greensboro this weekend. He will die, and you will go and take that church. That was in February. Now, you just don't run out and start broadcasting that. Those are, those are things you don't share. Well, why did, why was, why was, was God saying he wasn't going to heal him? No. But he does know the end from the beginning. Amen. You know? And so, got the phone call. No, we don't need for you to go. He, he said he can't leave sheep. He's got to be there for his sheep. You know, and I understand that on one side. But you're dying. You need help. You, you, did, you, need, you need to get what you need so you could be there for them from now on. And um, so, that was February. Well, that, forget about it. I, you know, you go a week, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. You kind of forget about it. We get the phone call in May. He had gone home to be with the Lord. Now, when somebody was coming from, from FCF that first weekend, they wonder if I could come in the second weekend. And so I came and preached. And then the third weekend, another person from, came from Tulsa and came and ministered. And then at the fourth week on, they had me come in every week. And then finally about June, sometime in June, I said, can Ed just go in, uh, indefinitely as an interim pastor? So I'd drive up every Friday uh, or Saturday morning. We'd stay Saturday night, Sunday night, and drive back home on Monday. I was off on Mondays at the church in Greenville, so... You know, I would, I would just drive up every, every Saturday and, be, and miss Mondays anyway just, uh, and, and go back and I would preach them. Now, we're going through the June, July. We're into August. And finally, my, my pastor comes to me and says, Ed, what are you going to do about that church in Greensboro? I said, well, can I be honest with you now? He said, yeah. I said, the Lord told me back in February I was supposed to be the pastor. He said, why didn't you say something sooner? He said, I, was, I, said, I was just walking it out and letting it prove itself out. He said, well, that's what Pastor Harrison said. You're supposed to take it. I believe you're supposed to take it. I said, well, now we got an agreement. Everybody knows I'm supposed to do it. We'll do it. And we took the church in September. See, God showed me something in secret that I was in his presence. And I couldn't even share that. I shared it with Janie, and that was it. You, just, you can't walk into the church that you're coming into going, well, God showed me in February I was supposed to. I didn't share it. It took me five years or six years before I ever shared that from the pulpit about what happened. And most of the people had left. There. A lot of people left. You know, they, they loved that pastor. And I understand that. Mm-hmm. I do. You know, and they didn't like me. Um, I'm used to that, I think, by now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, no, I don't ever get used to it. You want to be liked. You want to be loved. Hallelujah. But, you know, some people don't like it if you won't compromise. I refuse. And so, and sometimes I guess I'm too brash. But that's how God called me. Hallelujah. Amen. So anyway, you don't, you don't share stuff like that. But see, God can show you stuff. Now, here's the problem we do. We'll get a word from God, and we think that's for everybody. God told you to call on him, and he'll answer you. He didn't say for Greg to call on him, and he'll answer you. Hello? We get ministers who do that. They get a revelation from God that might be specific to their church. Well, everything, every word's for everybody. Not everything. 
God might tell a church to do a thing a certain way. He might tell you to have a bus ministry. And we go around teaching everybody. You got to have a bus ministry. Why? Because it worked for me. Yeah, but if God didn't tell me to do it, it's not going to work for me. Hello? He might have a brute squad ministry for our church. We just send them to the door and drag them out of the house and drag them over here. I don't know. Where's Andre the Giant when you need him? Uh, you are the brute squad. All right. Princess Bride. You got it? Hallelujah. All right. Now, we have to hear from heaven. Are you here? In your individual life, you've got to call on God. You've got to hear from the, from the throne of God. Now, let me say this. Because God spoke to me so supernaturally. And when he tells you somebody's going to die, you're moving and you're taking the church. Months before it happens. You don't have to wonder. Because I was thinking, oh my God. That, what, what? I'm, I'm, you're, you're binding it in Jesus' name. Not so, Lord. Get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, you're, 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 you're not wanting to receive that. Not that you don't want to go minister, but that's, that, that, that a fellow brother in the Lord, a pastor, is going to die. That's what's going to happen. Wasn't God's plan, God? Wasn't God's will? And I won't, I'm not going to try to get into reasons why or whatever. That secret thing belongs to the Lord. Amen? But the fact is, He did. Loved the Lord, He went to heaven. Glory to God. Amen. I said, He went to heaven. Loving the Lord. Amen. But you, you can't get into it. You can't even try to get into why's. But I'm, the, the, I'm just working on the other side of it. The Lord told me it was going to happen. Right. Amen. Amen. And so over the years when the, when the pressure has come to quit, I've got a word from God. God supernaturally spoke to me. God gave me a word. Didn't come from, wasn't the pastor Harrison prophet said, yeah, you're supposed to go to Greensboro and take that church. Pastor John didn't go, yeah, you're supposed to go to Greensboro and take that church. No, the Lord came in and said, I'm telling you, you're going to take that church. Now, you know what he hadn't said since then? Leave. We have got to get back to a stick to itiveness and, a, and, a, and a, just a flat out uh, aggressive, I'm going to stay with what the Lord said and not throw in the towel and not quit every time it gets a little tough when we've heard from God. I even had another minister friend tell me one time, man, if they did that to me, I'd, I'd just, I'd leave. It was a number of years ago we had, with that, when they had a really nasty thing going on. I mean, it was just, some guy was, Anyway, he messed up churches everywhere he went. He would go in as an evangelist and preach and then get phone numbers from the congregation and then be calling them and seeing how they're doing it, the pastors abusing them and stuff, and messing up churches from 200 miles away, splitting churches because he cares for the sheep so much. If you care for the sheep that much, you'd be a pastor, not an evangelist. Then he tried pastoring and was caring for the sheep too much. I won't go into what that was all about, but you can figure that one out. Doing a little too much caring for the sheep. Hello. Have y'all got, oh, yeah, got it? Yeah. After hour care. Two o'clock in the morning care. Muffled hair care. <laughs> what was that? Sheep baying. Bay bay <laughs> behave yourself old bearded wonder hallelujah but I, I can tell you that when you've heard from heaven I mean if everybody forsakes you if everybody leaves you <coughs> what God has told you you have to obey you have to follow after. But I, I, on the other side of that, if somebody else has told you to do it, that's your right. out. Yep. Greg came by one day, I said, no, I didn't, but 
Pat and Greg, I think you ought to do, start your own furniture company. Go sell furniture, man. Start your own company. It'd be a good idea. All right, Pastor. First time they're, 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 they're $3,000 in the hole for six months in a row. Pastor, you missed it. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You missed it. I did what you told me to do. And now I'm bankrupt. I'm quitting. Matter of fact, I'm going to another church because you can't hear from heaven either. Come on. See, we always want to work. Some people, I, we had a guy in our church in Greenville. What's this guy? This guy, we're calling on the Lord. I got all these scriptures. I'm, I'm going, I'm just, you know how I minister. I got, I got bunches of scriptures. We can read them, but we had a guy in our church in Greenville. He get, he, this lady thought he was the dial of prophet. She called him, Brother John. Not Pastor John, but another guy in the church. What's the word? She was in to prophesy. There is no such thing as a dollar profit. And don't be looking for dollar profit unless you're ready to receive the stuff you don't want to hear. Like, you're hard-headed. Or, this cloud of death is over you. Come talk to me three times and we can save your life. See, we want to hear you're going to be the, the champion of nations. You're going to float on the waters. You're going to have millions of people following after you. You're the greatest. You're the hottest. You're the most unique minister in the kingdom of God in the history of the world. All nine gifts of the Spirit operate in you. All five of the ministry gifts operate in you. You are only, uh, uh, only succeeded or superseded by Jesus Christ himself. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Dad Hagen had a lady like that Well, her, received a word from somebody one time. He's sitting there preaching, and this woman's rocking. He knows every once in a while she would stop rocking. So finally, he got, after, after a few services, he asked her, he said, Sister, what, what's going on? She said, well, Brother So-and-So came by and laid hands on me and prophesied beside me. He said, I had the spirit of rocking. When you're in the spirit, I'm rocking. When you're out of the spirit, I stop. He said, Sister, that's what I call laying empty hands on empty heads. She acted on it. All of a sudden, she's the rocking star. She's rocking. You're in the spirit. She stops. You're out. I guess that means that, you know, you know when you need to stop ministering, when you need to start ministering. Brother Hayden finally said about people like that, he said if all their brains were dynamite exploded, it wouldn't be enough to blow their nose. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he was right. This is why we got to learn to follow the Lord for ourselves. Even when somebody prophesies, it's got to be in line with what the Lord's put in your heart that you're hearing from heaven. You know, the New Testament prophet affirms and confirms. He doesn't foretell. He foretells. The difference between foretelling, speaking by inspiration of the Spirit, and foretelling, prophesying about future events. See, we want everybody to prophesy about the future events instead of just bringing a confirmation or an affirmation of what God's already dealt with us about. What? <coughs> Go to Acts 13, 1. Hallelujah. This is good. You know it's good. Even if you don't like it, it's still good. Hallelujah. Now, there were in the church at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, which was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, which later was called Paul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, now stop, don't read, stop. What are they doing as a group? They're all seeking the Lord. Now in this case, they're seeking the Lord corporately. But listen to what he says here. Separate Barnabas and Saul for the work wherein to I, what? Have, I have called them. They're already called. They're already operating in some things. I've already called them. Now separate them to it. And then they did just, just get real quick. And when they fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Notice that they didn't just jump right up and run off on that. They spent some more time before the Lord. What for? Before we start making lifelong uh, commissions and decisions and stuff, and saying this to the Lord, we better make sure we've got God on it. 
too much of our circles want to be the one that had the word. Want to be the one that, got, that gets the credit for something. Well, you're wrong in the heart motive anyway. If you're looking for the credit, you got the wrong motive. Hello. The glory needs to go to God. Now, it's amazing. It's, we want the credit when everything works out good, but we want to blame them for not hearing from heaven right when they don't. Well, I don't know what happened. They must not have heard right. The, the Lord must have meant something and they didn't hear it. Or the Lord must have told them something and they didn't do it. But as long as they're doing great, oh, yeah, I'm the one that prophesied and told them to go. Look, you donkey. Think about it. You're no better than the donkey. The donkey prophesied to Balaam. Hello? We're no better than a chicken. Now, I'm, I, I understand what I'm trying to say. God can you? Jesus said that if, if the people didn't cry out and praise him, the rocks and stones themselves would. When we start talking about and trying to take the glory or the credit for something that was done by the Spirit through us, we're a vessel. The donkey was a vessel. The chicken was a vessel. Now we're not on the same plane. I get that. I understand that. I'm not, but I'm trying to get, make a point here that we can't start taking the glory for it. And so what they did here is even after God spoke, they fasted and prayed more. They wanted to make sure they were on target. We want to make sure they were hearing from heaven. I, um, how many of you ever heard of C.M. Ward? Used to be with the Assemblies of God, and Brother Ward's gone home to be with the Lord. And uh, we were sitting at a table with our, our, church, our church in Greenville, Pastor Zabowski. Um, we, we had CM Ward come in, we had Lester Summer all come in, had a lot of big you know, people come in and minister in the church. And we get to sit around the room with them afterwards and, and, and let them talk. You, know, you get somebody like a CM Ward or Lester Summer all that's been in the ministry at that time 40, 50, 60 years, and you're getting to sit in on that, that's just heavenly. And uh, Brother Ward started talking about when he got ordained. A little bit different than today. You'd make your application to the assemblies. And then you'd come in for, for, your, for, the, uh, for a meeting with the elders. And they'd just bring you into a room and they'd just all sit around. And they wouldn't say anything. You thought you might be going for a Q&A? They were just sitting there. And they'd just look at you. Now most of y'all already get nervous and I'm not saying anything. And just look at you. They'd sit around and look at you. We said, well, what they were doing, Brother Ward? They said, they were discerning me. They were sitting there waiting for the Holy Ghost to speak to them. They just didn't look at my qualifications that I had finished the school course and that I had four recommendations from four friends or whatever. They sat there and waited for the Spirit of God to speak. That's how these people were put into the ministry. They were discerned by a, board of, by a group of elders. They just sit there. And you got to think, what's going on? They trusted the Holy Ghost to speak. If there was something in their life that shouldn't be there, the Holy Ghost could deal with it. Well, he can't, he's not ready for the ministry because he's, he's doing this. Or, well, he's in adultery. Brother, the Lord showed me you're in adultery. Would God, would God do that? It's better before he's in the ministry than after. Just heard of a case where a, a, a man's been in the ministry uh, over four decades. A bishop from the denomination came and stripped him of his credentials in front of the church. Apparently he wasn't repenting because they found out that he'd been in adultery at 35 of the four decade plus marriage he'd had. With women in the church. Finally, somebody got, somebody, the right person got a hold of the information and stripped him of his, of his ordination and everything. Well, is that right to do? No. Well, if they were unrepentant, they'd have to do it. Yeah. If they wouldn't step down, they'd have to do it. You know? Now, I, th I think I shared this other week. You remember Jimmy Swaggart? Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is not gospel. He, this was all public. Uh -huh. this was everything, everything about this was public, and so I'm not... I'm not Sharing something that wasn't public or well well known, well documented publicly. <clears throat> but see, when he when he got caught the first time, 
um, his conference simply said he had to get off television for six months or something. Springfield got a hold of that and said, no. He's out of the pulpit for two years. This is, this is what we do. They have a restoration program. They don't, they, don't, they don't cast you aside. The two years is a restoration program. You're brought in for counseling. I, I believe they have some type of fund to help, help support them while they're doing this. They're brought in for counseling. They're brought in for ministry. They're dealt with, with with the sexual sins that they're dealing with. They're, they're, they're dealt with, and, they're, and, they're, and, and during that time of ministry and restoration, and after two years, they'll put them back in the ministry. So the, the whole program is to restore them so that they are not cast aside but effective. Okay? Now, he, he said, nope, and left the denomination. Because he wouldn't keep doing it. You know what happened about six months a year, until a year later? Got caught again. The ministry never recovered fully. Why? Because if he had accepted the council, you know, what the, the church was doing, they could have restored him and put him back and said, look, he, had, he, he, he was calling sin. We are counseling him. We're ministering. He's not public ministry anymore. He's out of that ministry. But during this time, we're going to restore him. And when he comes back, he'll be ready. Praise God. That's what they wanted to do. But he rejected that. How did I get off on all that? Yeah. Oh, separate work for the... Oh, make sure you're here from the Holy... Oh, I know what I said. They were, they were discerning him. And, the, you know, if you're doing something wrong, they're going to tell you, no, you're not, you're not ready. There's things in your life that need to be dealt with. That's a whole lot better than having a church tore up. Yeah. Well, he's, just, he's so charismatic. He's got a gift. But if that gift is not tempered and used properly, it can bring great damage. So we need to hear from heaven. Ordaining councils need to hear from heaven. Amen. Men of God need to hear from heaven. Corp church people need to hear from heaven. We all need to hear from heaven. We need to be calling on the Lord and let him speak to us. So we can follow after his will and his plan. I know we divert. We, I'm bringing it back. <coughs> Amen. Call me and I'll answer you. I'll show you. Amen. And even after God showed them, they spent some more time in fasting and prayer. Don't be so quick to run off after something. Come on now. It may, it, God may, listen. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would have done to the church if I had come in the first Sunday and said, you know, I, the Lord showed me back in February he was going to die and I'm supposed to take this church. Yeah. I'd have never walked back in the door. They'd have called Tulsa and said, don't you send him back here. So you can't say everything. Things you need to walk out. When you hear from God, you need to just let things, sometimes there's going to be many times, you're just going to have to walk it out. And let, it, and let it fall into place as you go down the journey. Yeah, I know it's in my heart. Let me tell you something. Um, I don't know why I'm over here today. God woke me up at 5, 4 o'clock, 4.30 this morning and told me to talk about calling on you. So I'm just going to follow him and, and he's getting to somebody. I remember when I first got saved. I got saved July 19, 1979. A year later, I left to go to Tulsa. J.D. got saved a week later. And filled with the Holy Ghost, sang four songs in tongues. Took me four days to get filled with the Holy Ghost because I went back to work and said, hey, I got to say this. I said, now, now they'll tell you you got to tarry for the Holy Ghost. Just ask when you get filled. I went back Sunday night, got filled with the Holy Ghost. She came Wednesday night. After that, got born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. She didn't have any tradition. She was heathen. When you, see, a lot of times when you're just raised heathen, it's just a whole lot better. You don't have anything to undo. Okay. How do this all that easier? I mean, that's wrong, wrong terminology. It's easier to lead the heathen when they come in. When they, get, when they want to get saved, man, you can just get them saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. They take everything. Traditional people brought up in the church that you've got to undo some stuff because grandma told them something. All right? That, so it's not, not better, but it's, it's easier sometimes. Hallelujah. And over in Europe, if you go over there with a Hagen Bible or a Copeland Bible, get rid of it. You may as well just carry one with nothing on it because the people have been over there saying, hey, they add it to the Bible. And they go show them the scripture where it says, he who adds or takes away, let it be a curse on Ethmia. See, those, those notes have added to the Bible. That's, just, that's dishonest. But uh, I got saved. And I remember in August of 1979, it just got in my heart. I was going to the Orient to preach. 
Oh, it's strong. I'm going to the Orient. Now, let me tell you, I thought I was leaving next week. Yeah. Are you here? See, it's so easy when you hear something to think it's right now. It's going to happen right this second. Well, is that so? Go check out Abe. Abe was 75 when the Lord told him. and was 900 when, he showed, when Isaac showed up. And he tried his own method in between. And we're still paying the price. Abraham went in the tent with Hagar. Uh, you know, a night with Abe. Not be a movie. <laughs> Going to the tent with Abe. And now we have the Ishmaels. Hello? And we still got issues. But I'm telling you, it's so strong. Anybody ever this God speak to you? It's so strong. My God, you're ready to sell your house. And I mean, you're taking off. You're going now. And we call that zeal. If it's not God, it's stupid. You can miss things along the way. You can miss vital connections that God has ordained for you to enter into along the way. And so God spoke to me. I knew I, knew I was going to orient to preach. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Okay? Well, then the next year I go to Ramah, come out of Ramah. You know, of course, when I went to Ramah, you know, I got off of the little, little thing like everybody else that was at Ramah that, around that time, 1980, 81, in that time era. We were all, because Brother Hagin was a prophet and a teacher, we are all called to be prophets and yeah. teachers. Everybody was going to have a traveling ministry. They were just going to love us everywhere we went. I mean, we were going to have, we, we were the cat's meow. I get back to, uh, get back to Greenville. I'm sitting in church at Faith and Victory Church in Greenville in the, in the old Edwards Hardware building. We had turned around. Still hadn't even updated. Updated that way. You come in the back door and you walked in with old theater chairs with painted concrete floor. A platform about this tall. Pastor John would lead worship singing himself. Debbie would play the piano. Sister Debbie. And, uh, you know, and Pastor John, if he, wasn't, if he wasn't leading singing, he was there on the drums. Thank God for new days. Anyway, no. He's probably glad I can actually sing somewhat now. I, I probably messed them up more than anything, me on the front row singing. And, um, oh, it was awful. You, you hear me now, you think, you know, Pastor Rick, I mean, okay, he, it's not horrid, bad, but not horrid. I was horrid then. Okay? I mean, the Brits would come in and go, that's horrid. Anyway. So I've been all this time at Raymond. I'm out of Raymond. Well, I'm a prophet that teaches the nations. I'm sitting on the front row of the church when I were having a really good service, just worshiping God. And all of a sudden, something hits me in the top of the head and just kind of flows down my body. And, and, and I hear these words say, I didn't call you to be a prophet and a teacher. I called you to be a pastor. And you got to understand, that era, that was a cuss word. Nobody wanted to pastor. No one. Wanted to put up with the stuff pastors put up with. They all wanted to blow in, blow up, and blow out. Come in and say what they wanted to say. Get a big offering and take off. They don't have you back. So what? I got another church I can go to. If you don't like what I say, I got to come back next week. Hello. If you get mad with me, I still got to come back next week. And you do too. And um, I heard the Lord say, I, I called you the pastor. Well, my, 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 that just messed everything up. I had to make an adjustment. Because I'm planning on traveling everywhere. I remember my first two meetings I held. They were both, my first two meetings were held in the same place, at the Chocowinity Community Center in Chocowinity, North Carolina. Do y'all know where Chocowinity is? That's where Laverne Tripp's from. Laverne Tripp was born and raised in Chocowinity, North Carolina. Got saved at the Piney Grove camp meeting about 10 miles out of Chocowinity. Cinder block hut about four foot up. Screen, screens the rest of the way up with yellow bug lights on benches. That was kind of, no air conditioning. I think it had some heat for the winter meetings. So I had to make an adjustment, so I'll start making an adjustment. Now remember, when I first got saved, I knew I'd go to Orient and preach. When we came to Greensboro and took the church of Greensboro, not about six months after we are here, pastor down in Asheboro. Do y'all mind if I share these? These are experiences in life. I know we're running a little bit late. Um, pastor down in, uh, that was down in uh, Ashborough at the time called me up and said, look, I've got Mark Brzee coming in uh, this weekend to do a Sunday service, but he wants to do at least another church while he's in the area. Would you mind having him come over? I said, no, I'll take him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Because I heard Dad Hagen mention his name. That's, 
That's all I've done. You know, that, and you, but I think the only time I really heard him mention his name was in the story between him and, him and uh, Doug Jones about the two girls that wanted to marry him that they were printing the, printing the invitations and buying the wedding dresses for. That's all I knew about Mark Brzee. These girls, and, and they tell him, we're not interested in you. We don't want to marry you. We're not going to marry you. They, and they go back and tell their friends, I don't receive that in Jesus' name. I believe I received them as my husband. Uh, yeah. And so Mark came. Man, we had some services. Down, down that, little, that little building down on Lee Street. We had, we had shag carpet up front. The little, so if somebody fell, they'd fall on carpet, not concrete. Somebody opened the side door, walk in. Street people would walk in. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. Just, you know, just, it, was just a, it was a location that, you know, wasn't great, but we had good services. And then Mark came here. We had him about five or six times over a four-year period. Well, we made that connection. Well, I'm at camp meeting, I think 92, 90, 91, 92, I think 92, because 93 is when I went. 92 camp meeting. And um, I'm sitting up in the uh, back uh, of the assembly center in the circle there, and, the, and, and then I look over, and I see Mark with Janet sitting there. They, came, they, they would come in late a lot of times because, you know, people, when you're well-known in places like that, people just, just attack you. Yeah. Brother Mark, you know, the, the Lord showed me this. What do you think about this? I mean, right now he's trying to get in on the service. He came to get ministered to. When you're ministering all the time, you need to get ministered to. And uh, I look over and saw him. And we, he actually, and I waved, and he waved, and, and that was it. Because we'd been in church several times. We'd developed a relationship. And I turn back around, and I hear these words. You're traveling Europe with Mark. And he had done this whole East German thing where they were bringing East German pastors over, even while the Soviet Union was still standing. And they were getting the uh, authority of the believer translated in Germany, getting it into, into Germany. And they got to praying. They got to praying. The, the iron curtain will fall. There'll be no bloodshed in our country. Guess which country didn't have any bloodshed? Germany. I said Germany had no bloodshed. Others did, but Germany had none. Because that's what they were confessing. They got a hold of that, began to believe and receive and act on that. And, uh, and I, and I kind of just started rebuking myself. You ever done that? Now, see, some people get cocky about stuff. I, I go the other way. I self-emaciate. You know, oh, who do you think you are thinking you, you would be big enough to go with him and do some things for God? So I start, that's, that was the stupidest thought you've ever had. I honestly, that's how I'm doing it. I'm not, I'm not, oh, praise God, God showed me I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm the big dog, hallelujah. The only place they call me big dog is at Wesley with the little kids. They come and hug my leg and, whoop, 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 whoop. anyway, it's, it's pretty funny. Because <laughs> I'm the big dog and they're the little dogs and, we, we, we go to the dog house and find out what we're going to do for class. And they all bark. Kids are great. I love kids. Ninth graders don't do it, but the little guys do it. Anyway, that would be weird. They still call me big dog. They just don't bark. All right. And so, you know, I, I kind of struggled with that for a few minutes thinking, who, what, what, who do you think you are? Well, the next day, we're at the assembly. We come in. We come in the back of the assembly center. We're walking around, and Mark is standing there on the end. If you understand how, you know how Coliseums are. They go up, have a walk level, then they go back up. He's standing on the end, on this walk level, talking to somebody on the, the upper level front row, talking to somebody. And, and I'm walking by. He catches me out of the corner of his eye, and, I'm, and I just I kind of wave, and I'm going to go by. I'm not going to disturb him while he's talking to somebody. And he just grabs me and says, wait a second. So I, I step back off, and I just kind of wait there. And he finishes talking to this person. I don't, I don't even know who it was. And he turns around and says, now look, um, he said, we're starting Bible schools in Europe. And we're, and we're going to have guest ministers come in and preach uh, like three weeks out of the four weeks of each school during the month. He said, and I want you to go. See, when, you, when you're, you're in the presence of God, God can speak to you. Now, I'm, I'm like, well, I don't have to, I don't have to, I said, God just told me yesterday. I mean, I was kind of excited then. I saw self may say and thinking, I heard from God. It's always good to hear from God. Woo! Amen. And then they came to the church uh, in January of that next year before I left in February. January, February, November, January, I forget now. But he came to church and ministered again, and we got to talk about it. So I was going in February. I was going to Estonia, and I was going to uh, uh, Sweden, following Sweden, to minister. See, God speaks. Well, now here, we do this. I go to a number, number of schools over the next few years. Go to Czech Republic. Go to England. Go to, uh, to Germany. And that's where we find out the, the word germinate in Germany means Deutschland. 
if it's interpreted that, know what he's doing. I tried to talk about seed being sown and germinating. So I said it will germinate, and the guy goes, Deutschland did it. And, and John Greenwald's sitting back there, and he goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> germinate and Germany are not the same thing. Deutschland in Germany is Germany. That's what it means. It means German. It means Germany in German, Deutschland. I said germinated, and so the guy thought, it's Deutschlandated. It took us 15 minutes to get the concept that the seed germinates and him get Deutschland out of his head. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, Czech Republic, Italy, Thai, uh, Thailand. Uh, actually, Thailand's later. I mean, we'll get to Thailand because we're getting to Thailand. Spain. All, going back. I'm I mean, just ministering all the time over there. This is what we're talking about. This is part of our base of operation. Remember we talked about November? Our base of operation. We've got to get back. I, I have got to get back to doing these things. That's part of our calling. So that means money's got to flow through this church supernaturally because I have a ministry. Estonia is in danger right now. They, they think that Estonia may be in danger of the Soviet Union trying to take it back over after what they just did in the Ukraine. Um, and because, you know, they say it's, it's the way the Russians are being treated there. And there's only a river 30 foot wide that separates the countries. Been there, been right up to the river. Had the, had the, picture, had the statue of Lenin, Lenin tipped over. He's laying on his side. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> and, um, and so we're into this thing all maybe four or five years of going to these schools, and then I pick up Mark Brzee's newsletter one day, Vision Magazine. And um, in there he says, I was flying in the jet looking at some stuff, and I turned to a page, and, and, and I think maybe the, the, the airline, you know, routes of the world, and he saw Asia, and the Lord said, what you did in Europe will work in Asia. And as soon as I saw that written in his magazine, I said, that's it. That's it. That's it. There's, I'm going to Asia. I remember back in, back in uh, 79, August 79, the Lord told me I'd go. This is, this is 1999. 20 years later, I stepped off that airplane in Bangkok, Thailand. It was 90 degrees that night. Muggy. I mean, muggy, muggy. And tears welped up in my eyes. Because the Lord spoke to me 20 years before and said, you'll go here. And I didn't have to make it happen. I didn't have to force it. I didn't have to work it. Following God. God created good relationships. Open doors. And, and, and Brother Bill got the ticket for me. I mean, he, I, we paid for it. But I, I remember I got online one day. I was going, going to Bangkok. Glory to God. Hallelujah. What's the dates? I go, okay, I've got the dates. I'm going to get my airline ticket. So I looked at Swiss Air going from Greensboro through, through I hated Newark at the time. Newark to um, uh, Switzerland. I forgot, I forgot where we were flying in Switzerland. Zurich. Flew into Zurich and then fly to Bangkok. Y'all ready for this? I was going to go first class. It's too far to go in coach. It just is. I mean, you, you would be wasted. But the trip to Bangkok, Thailand, going through Europe, was $13,999 for first class. So I said, how much is business class? They said $10,999. I said, how much is coach? $3,999. Called Brother Bill. I said, Bill, get me a ticket to Bangkok, Thailand, first class. Calls back about 30 minutes. He said, Expedia has it going west. Greensboro to Detroit to Tokyo to Bangkok. First class, $747, dollars All right. Woo! Glory to God. Slept, got homemade ice cream sundaes, hot fudge sundaes. Had my feet laid out, hallelujah. Bedroom slippers and bathrobes. Up in the nose of the 747, take you. Mr. T my name was on my seat when I showed up. They take you. I thought, this is the way to fly. If you're flying international, that's the way to go. My, 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 my. But <clears throat> here's the thing. God spoke to me, and it was 20 years in the making, mm -hmm. but I never forced it. And when, the, and when I saw that in that newsletter that day, he quickened to me. He said, this is it. I knew it was it. There are things in your hearts. You've called on the Lord. God's spoken to you. But there hasn't been 
the, if the effectual door of opportunity and that door hadn't opened, things hadn't, haven't worked out yet, don't worry about it. Stay steadfast. Keep God, there, sometimes there are just things God has to work out in, 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 in advance down the road for you to walk in there to be able to do that thing. And you've you got to burn to go. And that's the thing. If you go, you might burn. Burn up everything. Make bridges and burn bridges and, and destroy relationships ahead of time. That's going to take an extra supernatural work just to get them straightened out. Hello? Y'all hear you going home? We want to hear from heaven. How many want to hear from heaven? I want heaven's voice. I want to hear from the Holy Ghost. I want things that I can keep in my heart. I'm telling you. Glory. Now listen, um, how many know Ryan Hart Bunkie's coming here? We called, we called this past week. Uh, we, didn't get, we didn't get in on the meeting. Um, Janie, Janie sent me an email and said, look, we, we missed the meeting. We, we, didn't, we didn't know about it until too late. We want to be involved. Can we be involved? Oh, you can certainly be involved. I got their phone number to call them, everything. God showed me. I'm telling you, folks. Things don't happen by accident. Back in 1988, we came to Greensboro in 87. Jesse was a year old. We were, she was a month from being a year old when we took the church. And in the spring of 88, we had someone at the church. We were downtown on Lee Street. And after the service, I was sitting over on the side of the platform. And I have, I know it's a little bit late, but that's okay. We'll go shorter tonight. Is that all right? I'm sitting on the side of the platform over there. And like Dad Hagen would say, I had a mini vision. M-I-N-I, -I, mini vision. You ever heard him say that? You know, not mini, M-A-N-Y, but M-I-N-I. -I. He always say, M-I-N-I, -I, mini vision. Well, that's what I had. It's just a flash. But in that flash, I saw something. Standing on the earth in this area, look up at the heaven, and the sky was dark, just dark, 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 clouds of darkness. And while I'm sitting there looking at that, this shaft of light comes up, and I hear the Lord say, that's the prayers of the saints. And when we got to the cloud, the cloud opened up a little bit, and I was caught up at the cloud at that moment. This happened in like a split second. I mean, th spiritual things can happen so fast because the brain can process way beyond what's going on in the natural. Sometimes you wonder why I, I get kind of tongue-tied. I probably need to believe God for healing. I never really thought about it much, but my brain works faster than my mouth can keep up with it. I'm always trying to catch up to the things that are running out here with my mouth. And I, and I can start stuttering or, or running. It's, it's like it's going, and I'm trying to keep up with it. So it's not that I just like talking fast. I'm trying to keep up with what's coming, you know. And um, praise God. We just trust you get it anyhow. <laughs> Glory. Amen. And, uh, I get caught up, and when I get up, caught up to the cloud, I see it's demon spirits locked arm in arm over the earth, over, the, over this area, really. But when that shaft of light went up the hole, and it started opening up more and more and more and more and more, and when it did, Jesus came down through the hole. When Jesus came down, he stood on the earth. He leaned over and picked up the Piedmont triad in his hand and lifted it up to heaven. And when he did, the only way I can describe this thing, y'all want to know what a genie lamp looks like? You know, you saw I dream a genie as a kid. You know, hers was the thing. But the, the old genie lamps where they were, they were really, they were really like uh, oil lamps where they had the, had the neck, and they had the fire over here. And, but this one just dipped out of heaven, and liquid drops of light fell on it, on the, on the area. And I heard these words. There will be a revival that starts in the Piedmont Triad that will spread up down the east coast of the United States of America. Now, I always thought somehow or another it was going to be our church that did it. See, we can interpret things. Yeah. Now, i got news for you. You think we've been... Dry, dead, stuck, not growing, whatever. The next scene I'll tell you in a minute. But he said there'll be a revival that starts in Greensboro, starting down the eastern, eastern seaboard of the United States. It's not a mistake that Reinhardt Bunky's coming to Greensboro to have one of his three East Coast meetings. New York, Florida, and Greensboro. When is the date? Of this year? September of this year. He's going to come to America and hold revivals like he held in Africa because America's gotten cold. He's calling to America to repentance, to come to God, to serve God. And America, and America shall be saved. Glory. So he stopped doing Africa. 
He's been kind of, God said, come to America now. He's not, he's not going to Africa, he's coming to America. The lethargic church, the, the state of the apostate church. He's coming to America to call us to repentance and have a revival. God showed me in 1988 this was coming. And I've shared this before public. It's not like a, oh, Ron Hart Bunkers coming, I'm going to make up a story. No, I've shared this over the years, every once in a while. Revival's coming. And then the very next thing, left that revival, and I saw our church. Now, this was allegorical, not necessarily specific. You understand what I'm saying? A yep. church was a square building with revolving doors on all four sides. And as far as you could see in every direction, it lined up at each door where people lined up, and you could see they were spirits. They weren't their physical bodies. They were their spiritual bodies. They were full of darkness, death. They would come through the door and go back out, and they were light. I'm telling you, I am telling you, America is primed for a move of God. And let me say this. The devil thinks he's getting everything ready for him to take over, but not until. God has his way. And there's a great calling of repentance to the earth. Are you here? The greater revival will be that of God catching away billions of people into the kingdom. Y'all here? I know we get to, you know, we start teaching, looking at end times and it's getting bad and the Antichrist is going to take over, but not until God has a move in this gospel. It's preached to all the nations of the earth. And now it needs to be preached in America again because American churches aren't even preaching the gospel anymore. Not all of them, but a good portion. We're preaching, we're preaching joy. We're, and I'm not talking about the joy of the Holy Ghost. We're preaching happy, clappy church. We're preaching, you know, do what you want. It doesn't matter. We're preaching all kinds of stuff. And God's coming to call people to a, a holy lifestyle with him. We are all about Jesus and getting people saved. It's coming to America. It's coming here. So all I got to say to you is this. Ah, get ready. Get ready. Ah, get ready. Get ready. Because here it comes. Dun, dun, dun. Get ready. Because here it comes. He's on his way. Get ready. <laughs> Come on, guys. Hook up with me. I thought I was doing pretty good. You don't know get ready? Nathan, let's get it saved. Dick, Nathan, Dick, let's get it saved. Get a, get, a, get a saved version of get ready. Amen? He's on his way. Get ready, because here he comes. Mm. Ow! Are y'all here? God shows us things. <clears throat> what if we quit? What if we're not here? What if we're not here when, when, when the revival starts? Then what God showed me couldn't come to pass because I disobeyed and didn't follow through. Amen. Got to get our hand to the plow and not look back. Amen. Got to be ready to go. And yeah, pressure comes. Pressure comes from the evil one. Pressure. From the external to be moved from your place. Pressure on your spirit and on your mind. But pressure that flows through your flesh. Resist the evil one. Submit yourselves unto the plan of the Most High. The enemy will flee. You will walk in the blessing. And you'll see the, you'll see the fulfillment and the end of that which you long for from the beginning. And glorious shall be the end. Glorious shall be the results. Great joy within and without. Oh, even the lost shall rejoice because they'll have a place to turn and come to. The lost shall weep with joy because you were there and stayed, remained steadfast. And now they have a home and they have a place because you didn't give in to the pressure. Resist it, resist it by my spirit, says the Lord. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, do not become shipwrecked in the days that lie ahead. Change your course and follow the winds of the spirit 
and see what great and mighty things, the hidden things you have not known yet. Cry out unto me in the midnight hour, and I'll speak to you and show you. And a great turn shall come in your life and in the atmosphere of this church. Great shall be the turn and transformation. And mighty shall be the work of God in your midst. Hallelujah. 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 Glory be to God. I said glory be to God. There's been great pressure. Great pressure. How do you know? Because I'm getting pressured. Hallelujah. Praise God. Don't, don't think you're by yourself. I get pressured. Glory. Good things are, good things, this may not be the right word, but are amiss. You know, great things are abounding in our midst. All right, praise God. Amen.